Welcome back to Historical Context. Today we continue our colonization of New England unit by talking about the Plymouth Pilgrims. Now before we get to the part where they jump off the Mayflower and settle in New England, I think it's important to understand who the Plymouth Pilgrims were. And the story actually starts several years prior to the Plymouth Colony. The story begins in England with English Puritan separatists. They essentially believed in the separation of church and state. In addition, they believed that the Church of England, which was church and state, was immoral, and they were greatly troubled by this. William Bradford, who wrote of Plymouth Plantation and will be a central part of our Plymouth Colony discussion, was central to the colony's start, and he was born to a wealthy English family in 1590. His father died when he was young, his mother remarried, and he was sent to live with his grandfather, who then later died, and then back to his mother, who died when he was seven. So a lot of volatility in the early life of William Bradford. At age seven, Bradford was sent to live with two uncles. He was unable to work due to a long illness and as a result began studying literature and the Bible. At the age of 12, Bradford heard a sermon by the Reverend Richard Clifton and was inspired to join the separatists movement, despite the disapproval of his uncles. In 1603, the ascension of King James I saw a crackdown on church reforms. By the time the Jamestown colony was founded, Reverend Clifton and another reverend by the name of John Robinson were leading secret meetings. So the English separatists were now meeting in secret because practicing their faith was no longer legal in England. In 1607, a group of 50 were arrested for those secret meetings, with many of them being imprisoned and fined. It was at this point, 13 years before going to New England, that the group decided to leave England. One problem, it was illegal to leave the country. So between late 1607 and the summer of 1608, small groups defected from England, but not to the New World. They instead went to the Dutch Republic. But with this change going to the Dutch Republic came many unforeseen hardships. The group lost all of its wealth getting to the Netherlands. They did not know the language. They had to take menial jobs to support themselves. It's hard to be a skilled laborer in a country when you don't know the language. As Thomas Hutchinson wrote, and he was a early colonial scholar, actually lived during the American Revolution, he pointed out that the group began to rethink their strategy. Let's take a look at William Bradford's writings. In 1617, they began to think of removing to America. They laid great stress upon their particular tenets, but this did not lessen their regard to morality. The manners of the Dutch were too licentious for them. Their children left them. Some became soldiers and others sailors in the Dutch service. In a few years, their posterity would have been Dutch and their church extinct. They were at a loss whether to remove to Guyana or to Virginia, but the majority were in favor of the latter. The Dutch labored to persuade them to go to Hudson's River and settle under their West India Company, but they had not lost their affection for the English and chose to be under their government and protection. They applied to the Virginia Company for a patent of part of the country. And so suddenly it became important 
to be English and to continue to be English, something they hadn't considered before, and that's what allowed them to apply for a patent. The king refused their patent request. In 1619, the separatists tried again, and this time they were granted a patent. They sailed first to England to obtain shipping and funding from a group known as the English Merchant Adventures. Remember, they were not totally broke, but pretty close to it. So there's no way they can fund it. So they went to the English merchants to do this. The two ships designated to carry them to America were the Speedwell and the Mayflower. Early on, it was determined that the Speedwell was not seaworthy. So many of the Speedwell's passengers had to be crammed onto the Mayflower with 50 members of the merchant adventurers whose trades and skills would help them build their colony. Some Speedwell passengers stayed on the boat and ended up going back to Holland. The separatists also had to negotiate amongst each other and with the merchants financing the trip. One of the key negotiating points was that after seven years, the assets of the colony would be divided up equally between the adventurers and the planters, the people settling the plantations. It appears that this was a way for the merchants to cash out of their investment, but also for the colonists going over to rid themselves of their debt. Children under the age of 10 who came to the colony would be granted 50 acres of unmanured land. Bradford personally was upset at the results of the negotiations because the merchants had previously agreed to give the home lots to the planters. However, the Puritans would come to America deeply in debt to the merchants. Despite the heavy indebtedness, the Puritans still had to come up with some of their own money to make this happen. One such wealthy Puritan who helped finance the expedition's supplies was a man by the name of John Carver. The group took off from Devon, England on September 6th 1620 for America. So they lived 13 years outside of England before going to America and not a lot of people know that. They think that they just fled out of England, scared for their lives, looking for somewhere to go. While some of that is true because it was illegal to practice their faith, they actually spent 13 years in the Netherlands before going to America. Bradford would later refer to the mix of separatists, or Puritans, and non-separatists, which were the merchant adventurers, as pilgrims. And that's where the name Pilgrim came from. Meanwhile, in New England, little had changed in the way of colonial effort after the failure at Popham. We talked about that last week. The English are visiting the shorelines of the East Coast more often and are interacting with the natives. One such native was a man named Squanto. Squanto was born around 1585 and was a member of the Pawtuxet tribe. In 1605, about the age of 20, he traveled to England with George Wymouth and served Sir Fernando Gorgias for nine years before being allowed to return to his home in 1614 as a part of John Smith's expedition to map what he coined New England. Not a lot of people know this, but John Smith came back to New England to map out that coastline he never went back to the Virginia colony, which we talked about in our Jamestown unit, but he is the one who actually coined the term New England. 
and Squanto was with John Smith when he returned to his home. Imagine the, the type of experience that would be to share that. But Squanto, unfortunately, was not home long before he found himself and 26 of his native countrymen captured by a man named Thomas Hunt, a slave trader, who sold them into slavery in Spain. So Squanto goes from his home to England, back to his home, and now in slavery to Spain. Spanish priests who were opposed to slavery managed to free him and smuggle him out of the country to England, but not before introducing him to Christianity. Squanto ended up in England working for an explorer who led an expedition to and from Newfoundland in 1617, in which Squanto participated in as a guide. In 1619, Squanto was permitted to return home. When he arrived, he found things vastly different. And before we get there, just think about this. This is a 14-year period. He goes from his home to England, back to his home, stolen in slavery to Spain, back to England, on an expedition to Newfoundland, and back to England, and then back to his home area in Massachusetts. And he gets there and finds that a plague has decimated his tribe. And this plague is presumed to have been started by the English, not intentionally, inadvertently through exposure, but the true origins of this plague remain unknown. Squanto would end up becoming the only survivor of his tribe, and many other tribes in New England would be wiped out as a result of this epidemic. It was horrible, and in fact, we kind of hinted in the Jamestown readings of hearing about this. So it, it traveled a long way from uh, the New England shores. As a result of his travels, Squanto could speak perfect English and ends up living right in the area where the English Puritans would eventually land. So all of these chance events are preparing to bring them together. Fast forward to September of 1620, where the Mayflower is now on its voyage to America. Bradford notes that many on the ship were seasick, and some of the merchants didn't take kindly to it. Let's have a look at the writing. There was an insolent and very profane young man, one of the sailors, which made him the more overbearing who was always harassing the poor people in their sickness and cursing them daily with grievous execrations, and did not hesitate to tell them that he hoped to help throw half of them overboard before they came to their journey's end. If he were gently reproved by anyone, he would curse and swear most bitterly. But it pleased God before they came half seas over to smite he young man with a grievous disease of which he died in a desperate manner and was himself the first to be thrown overboard thus his curses fell upon his own head which astonished all his mates for they saw it was just the hand of God upon them so clearly the differences between the merchants and the Puritans were causing strife on this Mayflower journey. And not a lot of people talk about that today. The fact that clearly there were people behaving in such a profane way that the thought of possible violence appeared to be there. To make matters worse, the ship itself faced several storms and leaked heavily. At one point, many doubted the ship would be able to make it. The main beam of the ship was buckling, and that led to the greatest amount of concern. But after some consultation, the group decided to sail onward. They also found an, an iron 
fitting that they were able to uh, sort of reinforce that main beam with. Bradford goes on in Of Plymouth Plantation to tell the story of John Rowland, who was thrown overboard in a squall, but managed to hold on to the top sea halyards, as he called them, which they hung overboard and were underwater. And he was able to be retrieved onto the boat. So a, a harrowing journey there for John Rowland. They reached Cape Cod in early November and headed. they were going to head south towards their intended target, which was the Hudson River. But the weather conditions kept them from doing so, so they stayed in the area. Thomas Hutchinson, who I mentioned earlier, who also lived a century later, alleges in his book on the history of Massachusetts that the captain of the Mayflower was bribed by the Dutch to go north and avoid the Hudson River. But there is no evidence of this. And frankly, Bradford's writings contradict this because Bradford even says the Dutch wanted them at the Hudson River. Bradford noted that the crew was rather beat up by the crossing, and it was made more difficult by the fact that there were no inns, houses, or towns to greet them on the shores of Massachusetts. So now the pilgrims must find a place to settle, and we will start there next time on Historical Context. <laughs>